Today's message is, as a man thinks, as a man thinks, as a man thinks. And um, before we get into the message, a few disclaimers that are extremely important. Number one, um, it's a privilege, it's an honor to share the Word of God with everybody in this room, um, a cosmopolitan group, um, very representative of the South Africa, the rainbow nation we know. So there might be some things in this presentation that might not really go according to your culture or your understanding or your beliefs. I ask that you'd forgive me in advance, but that we would be able to just work with the Word of God as is. Are we agreed? Uh, the second thing is no disrespect is meant to anyone who might feel convicted or pinpointed by what would be said here. Um, I've had conversations with some of you. I've heard other things about other people. This message is not intended to be directed to anybody. Are we clear? It is a message to empower us. Is that clear? Let's just get that out of the way so that after this, there isn't a, okay, I know he's a friend of, and so I think maybe that's why, just so that we get that out of the way. Um, this message has been heavy on my heart. It's something that I'm personally going through, and I know that in this research that I covered, certain things begin to happen to me too, and I hope that these will begin to happen to you too, and that the change we're praying for as a church and as a people and as an individual, so to speak, might begin to uh, get to all of us as we, as we go through this. So we're going to go through this message, um, but before we go into the message, I'm going to ask us to please close our eyes and let us reverently invite the Spirit of the Lord to be here with us and to guide how we are going to do this. Let us close our eyes and pray. Father, good Lord, we come before your presence. We'd like to thank you for time. Time for us to grow. Time for us to know you and your heart. And time for us to change. Today it is time to listen. That by listening, we may become empowered and that we might become changed and that we would be renewed in our minds. Let this message fall on good soil, Lord. Remove every other thought and everything else that would come in its way and allow it to have the potency it deserves because it is your word. And let this word become flesh. May the church say, Amen. I love movies. Let's get that out there. I already warned you about what this message would be about, isn't it? There's certain things that you wouldn't really like, so here we go. I love movies. Who else loves movies? Okay. Okay, I had an amen right from the back there. Um, and I, I like a certain type of genre of movies. Uh, anyone guess what those are? Not you, honey. Anyone, anyone, anyone guess what those movies are? Movies that I like. Just, just yeah, you can... You can put me in a box, categorize me, stereotype me, stigmatize me, anything. Yes, sorry? Spy movies. Okay, I look like James Bond, black one, I guess. Um, any, anybody, Christian movies. Okay, that's very stereotypical. I'm here preaching, so safe choice. Anyone guess? Yes? Sorry? Action movies. Do I look like an action figure? Okay, cool. Which type of action movies? Comedy, action. Whoa. Jackie Chan, no. Well, let's get warmer, guys. Yes, color? Marvel fan. Okay, we're getting warm. Like, we're getting there. Okay, my, 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 but before I tell you what my favorite is, um, who loves war movies? Like, war movies. Like, war. Like, it's the guys only. I don't see a lot of... Okay, we've got a lady there. What's your favorite war movie? So, sorry? There's a couple. The first one that comes to mind. Fury. Okay, cool. Fury. Anyone else? Favorite war movie? Guys, come on. I know we're at church, but I'm asking you to talk. I have... Yes, sir. Yes. Sorry? Hexo Ridge. Hexo Ridge. Yes, that's a very good one. Has anyone... Who hasn't watched Hexo Ridge? Okay, I'm justified to say this in front of the pulpit. You need to go and watch that movie. <laughs> like, go look for it. Netflix, EDC, go watch that movie. It's absolutely great. Um, I'm a medieval war movie kind of guy. Medieval. Um, Lord of the Rings? Yes, we're getting warm. That kind of, that kind of style. And I can see, I can see people like chuckling, sorry? Vikings, Vikings yes. Uh, yes, I watched the series and then I saw a couple of things and I kind of stopped watching it. Cause, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the thing about these. They make them so well and then they throw in a couple of other things and you're just like, whoa, okay. 
Uh, I guess I'm not the only one who's been down that path. A lot of people have been down that path. Um, my favorite. Anyone know that movie? 300, right? Uh, famous sayings from this movie. This is Sparta. Yes. Anyone else? Any other, any other reference to this movie? Sorry? We'll fight in the shadow of darkness. We'll fight in... Yes. And you come here, you threaten my queen. Remember that? Um, yeah, this guy made me believe in movies in a big, big way. 300 was a firm favorite for a long time. Um, then came... Right, this one. Which one's this? Famous phrases from this one. Exactly! That's the one. Are you entertained? Um, and then the other one is, today is the day I saw a slave become more powerful than the emperor of Rome. Um, when it comes to the Bible, I'm an Old Testament buff. Um, I love the Old Testament stories because I believe they carry a certain realness that perhaps, and like I said, I might offend you, that perhaps the New Testament doesn't carry. New Testament sounds very f philosophical. So a lot of my mem favorite memory verses are actually from the Old Testament. Um, I like what goes on there. And maybe just to warn you, I'm, I'm a branding person. So I love stories, and I guess that's why that happens. But just so we're in the open and we're in the clear, there's something in the Bible for everybody. So what I find in the Bible fascinating for me is these stories. And for you, it might be something else. And the beauty of that is God captures us all. Different intellects, different levels, different races, different thoughts, different educational patterns, different uh, backgrounds, different ways we've been raised in, different households, and we all come to this nexus where the Bible is able to capture those. And I think Glenn covered that very well, speaking about close to over so many authors over a 2,000-year period and all of them writing coherently with the same thought pattern. And I think that's absolutely amazing. We're going to get into today's message. And coming off what is the movies that I enjoy and the people who reigned during that period, um, we'll hear a bit about what they think about thinking. Next slide, please. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius said these words. We become what we think about. A man's life is about what his thoughts make of it. We become what we, church can't be with me, we become what we, we become what we think about. And eventually your life turns out the exact same way that your, it is said, the body will follow where the mind will go. The body will follow where the mind will go. Here's a very uncomfortable thing I also got to discover. This might not sit well with you, but it's a truth. You are where you are today because of the thoughts you've had. You are where you are today because of the thoughts you've had. We'll cover a lot more of this in part two. And part one today is battleground. Part two next week is the promise. So we'll cover a lot more about that on the promise, but today we're speaking about the battleground and the importance of our thoughts. The body will follow where the thoughts are. As a man thinketh, so is so is he. Let's, let's unwrap this a bit. So, from one man in the Roman Emperor with much wisdom, next slide please, to another in the Bible with much wisdom. And he says, for, man, for as a man thinks in his, so is, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is, so is he. So you then might ask me the question, but what, wait a minute, isn't it saying, it is, isn't it supposed to say as a man thinks in his brain, right? So is he. Why are we saying the heart, like, no, the heart feels, isn't it? The heart pumps what? Blood. It feels. Like, why are we? Next slide, please. The heart in Hebrew is the inner man. It is the mind. It is the will. It is understanding. It is the inner part. It is the soul. And here's that phrase. It is the seat of emotions. In Greek, the same thing. It is the center of man as we know him. That's where you find thoughts, passions, appetites, desires, uh, passions. It's the very inmost, inmost part. Um, we're going to have several scriptures today. So if you have a notebook by any chance, or if you've got a phone, 
and it's got notes, just quickly just jot down the verses because we'll have quite a couple of verses. I wanted to try and make it simple, but in order to make this message truthful, there's gonna, we, we need to follow what the Bible says. So if you can just get that, and maybe if I can take the liberty of saying, if you want this message, um, please send us a DM on our social media pages. To send a DM like, hey, I need the notes on the message. And then, yeah, we'll ensure that uh, on the DM that you send in, just send your email link, um, communication, uh, trying to push you some, some traffic here. <laughs> just send a DM and, uh, we'll, uh, and your email and we'll make sure to send this to you. So, the heart of men thinks. Jesus Christ himself says, why do you think evil in your hearts when you were speaking to the Pharisees? He looked at them, asked them a question, and then he said to them, why do you think evil in your hearts? And that's confirmation far enough that actually the heart actually does think because the heart is the center of all those things. Next slide, please. There is a battle in the mind and for the mind. I'll repeat that. There's a battle in the mind, and there's a battle for the mind. And the two are, inter are interlinked or inter intertwined or interlocked, whichever way you look at it. How many people have felt their thoughts conflicting at some stage? Have you ever felt your thoughts conflicting? Like you want to do this, but you want to do that. <laughs> And then somehow, each one of us just, you know, finds out a way of how to get things done. You know, like hocus pocus, like, okay, the first thing that comes, or wherever the heartstrings pull, or whatever. Uh, you've known of this, people say there's a, there's a pull between the heart and the mind, and uh, the emotions, and it's, this is not new, what we're talking about here. These are things that we have all come across at one stage or another. Next slide, please. How many of us have a security company at home? Someone who does stuff secure, right? Anyone? Vita Scholar, anyone? Okay, big guys with the big cars, right? On response. Anyone else with security at their house? Sorry, I don't think there's any thieves in here, so if you don't lift your hand, I'm not sure people are going to track you home and say, you know, like I know that they've got secure, right? Or Vita Scholar. Uh, how many of us have security? Security companies watching over homes. Okay, great. How many of us have doors that we lock at night? Okay. How many of us have, uh, what's that slam, slam thing? That, that slam? Trelly door, yes. Bam, right? Uh, we've, seen, we've seen the ads. Big ball comes and smashes the things and the thing just won't give in. How many of us have trelly door at the house? Okay. How many of us have burglar bars at the house? Like on the window, there's a bar somewhere? Okay, great. What are we protecting? What are we protecting? Okay, a beautiful chorus. We had one here. Uh, this is not a chorus. This is not a, a, a musical group. What are we protecting? Us. We're protecting our lives, isn't it? We're protecting because we think we are valuable. You will protect what is valuable. Um, the road is valuable, yes, but yeah, I don't see any gods guarding the entire road the whole time, isn't it? So the things that we love the most, we will protect. We'll take out insurance policies. We'll take out medical aid. We'll get a car that has all the airbags left, right, and center EDC because we're protecting what is. Next slide, please. Have you ever thought of your heart like this? The Bible says of all the things that you should really actually be guarding, you should actually be guiding your? Because that's where everything comes from. Remember, as a man thinketh, so is he. So is he. And the Bible's saying, listen, mate, uh, yeah, it's great for you to get Vitascola, it's great for you to get Secure, right? It's great for you to get any of those companies. But if I were you, if you knew what I knew as God, sitting on this very vaunted position, looking down on you, seeing what you do, where, where you are, if I were you, I would be guarding your heart. I think that's the most important thing. I would be guarding your heart. Um, Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there's no God, right? 
If you read a few verses down, it says, God looks down upon men to see if there are any who understand, any who see things the way he sees them. Like, guys, come on. The most important thing is your heart. Everything else is important, great, but the heart, because everything flows from it. The Bible even says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's saying everything comes from right within there. Um, I'm really having to move here. Next slide, please. Ordinarily, nothing gets captured willingly. Um, how many of you, if the police came in here and said, all right, cool, we are arresting you, would be like, hey, Jackie, right, come on, let's, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Would you be like, okay, guys, sorry, sorry, guys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I need to go, sorry, I'm, I just said. You'd be like, what, what have I done? What's going on? What do you, I, I need my rights, I need my lawyer, all kinds of things. No one gets captured willingly, right? Try and capture a dog that's really running. You know what that means, right? You're going to have to run after it. There'll be chaos on the road. You see even your own pet trying to call him. Try and capture a bird. It's going to try and flee. It's going to try and do whatever it wants. Nothing gets captured willingly. Nothing gets captured willingly. It could be birds. It could be animals. It could be political parties. It could even be an entire country through state capture. It's even fighting back. Even the box fought back a couple of days ago fought back from the brink of, you know, a uh, rugby disaster, which is what it had been for a while. People are talking about cricket now. There is a need to, to help that because it's been captured, whichever way you look at it. Nothing gets captured willingly. And because nothing gets captured willingly, next slide, please. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And this is where the rubber hits the road. And we take captive every thought. Not some, not a few, not many. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to. So, I can feel the stillness in the room. This is not really a subject that's kind of like, you know, it's, it's one of those. But it's a truth we have to approach. We take captive every thought. Now, I need you to just look at the wording that we've covered. We've looked at the word God, we've looked at the word captive, and both these words are words that are thrown very easily within the battlefield scenario. When you're in battle, you're guarding the stronghold, you're guarding the battalion, you're guarding the citadel, you're a sentinel watching over something. When you're taken captive, it's because you've gone into war and you've, you've brought back the spoils of war. Next slide, please. The battle for the mind. The battle for the mind. Let's not sugarcoat the matter. Somebody's after your mind. Because if they can get your mind, remember, the body will follow where the mind goes. Many studies have been done, and I won't get into so much of it because of time, but what I need to give you now is a truth that we all ought to know in one way or another. There is a real battle for the mind, and what you do with the mind really depends a lot on how you think. Next slide, please. The devil has two methods to get through to us. Method number one is called the early door. The theory behind the early door, early, 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 late versus early. The understanding behind the concept of the early door is most of us can track when was the first time we got exposed to a certain type of behavior that still has us bound till today when we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And usually that happened when we were very young. I have a friend. She was Roman Catholic, got eventually converted to being SDA. She got raped by the father, the priest of the church. A couple of times, the one time they were driving off to their family's house, they had a couple of visitors so they all couldn't fit into the car. 
And um, her father says to her, listen, you ride with the priest and follow to the house. And she kicked out aggressively and started throwing a tantrum and the father couldn't understand. And the father thought, my little child just wants to disobey me. And the father strong-armed her right to the priest's car. And when she got to the priest's car and the father forced her into the seat and forced the seat belt on her and closed the door shut on her, the priest said, see, I told you, I never believe you. She's been disturbed ever since. She's fought hard and hard and hard with depression. Recently, she got married a couple of years ago, um, but it's been a healing process. And I know what I'm saying is not strange. For some of us, if it's liquor addiction, it started at a very early age. Through somebody you respected, somebody you looked up to, and somebody you thought, wow, he is the man, just like we're talking about the movies. And it started off at that early age, and it continued. For some people, I could go on. You know the references, you know the examples. Some of the stuff happens in your life. Some of it you've kept it closed as, 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 as hard as you could. Some things you've opened up to, and some things have spilt out and destroyed families. My university friend had a girlfriend whom he thought he was going to marry, and she said, when the day comes for you to go to my family and ask for my hand in marriage, uh, within my culture, there's a certain amount of money that's paid, which is called bride price. She said, once they put out whatever the bride price is, I'm going to tell them that I don't want any money to be paid for me because I was already raped by my own brother and you guys knew about it and you did nothing about it. She said, and, and in her mind, she had put that event right up there. She was waiting for it to happen. The devil, with most people, will do his level best to open an early door that disturbs what goes on. Somebody puts it across like this. Your life is a well-organized home. You know how you organize your home just before you've got visitors? Uh, Friday night, Friday nights, you know, like, okay, I'm getting Friday nights, let me organize it, let me put, put everything in its place and make it really, really spick and span. Wipe the floors, EDC, everything else, and life is ding. And this is when they say, oh, that person has their life in order. They're so put together, right? But in that house is a back door. And to that back door, the devil has those keys. From the early time that he did what he did. And so routinely every now and then, once the house is spick and span and it's superb, he will come through with the keys, open up, create a havoc and a mess and everything else, and then leave with the key and close and go back and wait. Give it a couple of years and the person puts their life back in order, they, does it, they do everything, da 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 and then come back and... You know the story. You call it a relapse, you call it whatever you call it, that's the way it goes. It's the early door. And if you're here and you're a parent, I'd really encourage you to pray as hard as you can to ask God to protect and keep your children from that early door being opened. Through abuse, through stuff they're exposed to, anything. Anything that will eventually cause a major problem for them in the future. You need to be able to pray and watch over their lives like a sentinel to ensure that that stuff doesn't enter in. The reason for that is once it enters in at an early age, they become familiar with it and it becomes deposited in the heart or the seat of the emotions and it's a lot more tougher to get rid of. They say, give me a child within the first seven years and you won't be able to change the course of their lives from that point onwards. That's extremely important. The second method is the environment. And the environment is through either hereditary tendencies or just the environment you dwell and live in. Science has this for a fact. By beholding, we become changed. By beholding, we become changed. If I grew up in a household where the father bits on the mother the entire time, guess what's going to happen when I also get married? It's going to be the same because I'm seeing it the same way and it looks normal to me. I might speak out against it, but it's been deposited into my soul because it's what I'm seeing all the time. Many tests have been done about this with kids from a black neighborhood and how when they get to sit down for a test, they always never really make it better than kids from a richer neighborhood. 
but once they're made to believe in themselves and that sort of thing, and that door is unlocked, they then begin to perform very well. There's a certain way in which our environment can freeze our minds. My mother, at a particular age when we were boys, said to my father, I don't want to live in this area anymore. Uh, my father at that time had lost his job. I'm not saying this is a pre prescription for people's marriages, please. Just, just. Um, and my father was like, but what's the problem? I can afford this place and we can afford it. We can afford it at a decent meal, EDC, and this place allows us. We can, it's not the best, but it, and my mother said, no, I don't want my kids to be exposed to such thinking. So she forced my dad out of there and put us in a better place. That helped with my desire for certain things going on in life. I'm not saying that's always the best way, but what you expose your kids to or what you expose your minds to continually will begin to dictate how you think and how you operate. So, the devil comes to us through these two things, and it's extremely important for us to be able to be mindful of these things. Um, I'll give you a couple of references after this so that you can go and, you know, perhaps do a bit more homework, those of you that are interested, just so that we, we get to cover good time here. Let's go to the next slide, please. The battle, where? In the mind. The battle in the mind. The battle in the mind. And there's two things there with the battle in the mind. Let's go to the next slide. Your thoughts and your habit or habits. David. Okay, we're doing, old, we're doing Old Testament now. So, yeah, you can come along with me. You can even see my, my face. It's kind of smiling back. Um, David runs away from... Who was hunting for David? Guys, come on. Who was hunting David? King Saul. Thank you. Not Saul music, right? King Saul was hunting David. Um, and... There's a couple of close calls where at some point, if you remember, if you read your Old Testament very well, there's a point where Saul is going round a hill, you know, like he's about to catch David, and David is on the other hill, and it's really just basically cat and mouse. And then eventually Saul gets a message that, listen, you know, home's been attacked, did you see? Then he, he lives the chase right there at the very moment that he was about to catch David. And David is like, shoo, man, I'm, <laughs> this, is, this is too close a call for comfort. I can't keep doing this. And then he makes up in his mind, he's like, listen, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually go and live, I'm going to go and live in Philistine territory, enemy territory. Saul's not going to come looking for me there because if he comes there, it's an entire war with the Philistines. He goes to Philistines, he's like, hey guys, I'm David, the one who killed Goliath, the one who killed thousands, the EDC, da 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 I'm here, can you give me a refuge? And the, the Philistine king is like, whoa, okay, you, you want to join my army? Of course, of, like you, David the legend, come in. When he comes and says, listen, I'm going to give you a place called Ziklag, right? Uh, Z-I-K-L-A-G. Um, like jet lag, but zip lag. I'm going to take you to this place. You're going to leave over there. Uh, he goes and he leaves over there. Um, and while he's living over there, the Israelites come to make war with the Philistines, as was normal in those days. Um, and when they then get to the war front, the Philistine king says, David, I need you to come and fight the battle because I know what you can do militarily. I've seen you. I need you to join our, our, our army so you can fight. And uh, he then says, listen, I'm not really sure. But anyway, anyway, he comes through. When he comes through, um, a spiritual commentator says the angel of the Lord came through because the angel of the Lord realized what David had put himself in and the angel of the Lord uh, influenced the, the, the princes and the princes said to David, listen David, uh, you can't fight for us because we're not sure we can entirely trust you. What if you turn on in the battle and turn against us? This might be some sort of clever ploy. So just go back home. So he goes back home, but on his way going back home, this is what happens. He gets there. And while it's a few kilometers off, he sees smoke rising. This, look, this sounds familiar, Gladiator. Like when he came back and his, basically his entire household and all these men, their houses had been razed down and they'd been burnt. They get there and the Bible says the men were so, so to the heart and they wept and they picked up stones and they said, listen, David, you brought us here. We're going to stone you. At that point, the Bible says, David, you can almost feel the tension, think enough to cut through with the knife. The Bible says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And while everyone else is crying and weeping and everyone else wants to stone him, he's not saying, guys, I'm really sorry. I'm really we're like, guys, no, and trying to retreat. He's like, guys, please bring me the Urim and Thummim, which is the two stones that they used to determine between yes and right. And he, the priest comes over and says, listen, Lord, we're praying. Can we follow the Philistines? 
And God says, yes, you can follow the Philistine. They says, God, are we going to defeat the Philistine? God says, yes, you're going to defeat the Philistines. For the next three days, the guys walk following these guys. No water, nothing, no rest. They just followed them until they had a battle and they won with them. The question I want to ask you is, what was it about David that happened at that point? When everything else was against him and he needed and he was justifying giving up, it was the thought. He had spent time with God and he had a history of what God had done for him. At that point, instead of being discouraged, he encouraged himself in the Lord. And that's why our thoughts are extremely important. Thoughts are actually things. Um, I've got a quick video I'm going to show you at the end of this message, which is just like a few minutes from now, where we'll show you that actually your thoughts are real. They aren't They aren't airy things. It's not a philosophy. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not an intangible. A thought is actually an, a tangible thought. So, a thought is a thing. Then we've got a habit. A habit is what you do consistently over and over and over and over and over until it becomes ingrained. And going back to the same understanding of brain. There's a study called neuroplasticity. I think we've got a couple of medical people in this place. Neuroplasticity. And disclaimer, uh, God is the author of science as well as the author of the Bible, just so we don't have any conflict about that. Um, and science is a continuous effort that reveals who God is. It shouldn't be working against God. It should be working for God. Let's just get that out of the way. Um, and neuroplasticity teaches us that whenever we continuously do something over time, there's something that are called neurons that build into superhighways called boutons, and these superhighways become thicker and stronger over time, so much so that more electrical pulses can go through it, so much so that it becomes easier to do it. Some of you people, um, Carol, where's, where's Carol? Carol, where's your hand? Oh, you just got a license, right? Great. How long have you had your license, sir? Yes, yes, yours. 19 years. So, 19 years, couple of days, right? But I know you've been driving. 19 years license means he can afford to drive while on the phone. He can afford to drive while thinking. By on the phone, I mean with the speaker system coming through, not or texting. We don't encourage any irresponsible behavior. Um, there are certain things that he can now just do as second, second nature. Thanks, love. Second nature because he's done it long enough. But for something that's new, that's just coming on, it takes a bit more time to get used to. And it's the same concept with habits. Habits, once we do them over and over and over and over and practice them, they become quite strong in the brain. Uh, there's a lot of science behind it that we could go through, but because of time, we won't do that. If you build a habit, it becomes extremely strong and it becomes impossible. Not impossible, impossible is the wrong way. It becomes difficult to break. Someone once said, when you have a habit, you can take away the H. And you still have a bit. And even if you take away the A, you're still going to have bit. And even when you take away the B, you're still going to have it. So there's a certain level of layers you keep, need to still, kill, keep, still keep going at and going at until you get to the nut of the thing and be able to distill it. Um, next slide, please. The Bible makes it very clear that we can renew our minds. We can renew our minds if we let the Holy Spirit take over. Um, the reason I'm talking about the renewing of the mind is because without the Holy Spirit, we will continue to be the same old person with the same old patterns. Um, next slide, please. To become a different person, you literally have to become a different person. And what do I mean by that? Please play the next slide. Just press the button. Hopefully that plays. That's your brain. And those are the pathways that are being built even at this very moment while I'm talking to you. Your brain is active and it is connecting the things I'm talking about. When I spoke about an early door, it's connecting you thinking, okay, what happened to me in the past? And it's connecting and it's connecting, it's connecting until it establishes a, a stronger thought. And that stronger thought becomes that highway that things go back and forth on. 
And if the devil has established that highway, it becomes difficult for you to break it. But glory be to God Jesus. Because he says, I can make you a new man. David says, create in me a, O Lord, and restore me. The phrase says, it's impossible to teach an old dog new. New what? New tricks. It's not true. An old dog can learn new tricks. You've got white hair, you've no hair. Actually, you actually can you learn new tricks. And the Bible makes it very clear. Next slide, please. There's a study, Fire to Rewire, and those of you who were here with the gentleman who was preaching about Rwanda, which is two weeks ago or last week, he said this, and I went and researched on it, and I'm, I really encourage you going to YouTube and look for the video called Fire to Rewire and How to Renew the Mind. Uh, time is running out. Number one, be intentional. Be very, very intentional. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are right, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, think upon these things. Be intentional about the thoughts you have. If you're not intentional, you will simply roll into the day and the day will take care of you and you will react to what's happening rather than implementing. Number two, fight. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ Jesus. We already covered this verse. It tells you that in order to change your mind, there's going to need to be a fight. It's not going to come easy. Nothing gets captured easy. Then number three, you need to rewire the brain. You need to pull out the hard drive and put in a new hard drive. Rewrite the hard drive. And the way to do that is with the word of God. Thy word, O Lord, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Last slide. I did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of faith. It's two days before our wedding. Griselda has done a sterling job of organizing everything else and brought two families uh, from Zim and from Cape Town and were converging in Joburg. Um, big operation that she mounted uh, planning-wise to make things happen. Uh, finances, ETC, whatnot. Um, looking forward to it. Any person's looking forward to their uh, wedding um, and everything else that goes wrong with it. My parents have come through from Zimbabwe by bus to Khabaroni, then from Khabaroni connecting to, to Joburg, where they would then get through to. Um, uh, first thing is we go and we receive them. Everyone's happy, everyone's great, da 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 And then I ask, where's my brother? And then I'm told, no, he's following. I'm like, okay, great. So from then on, we drive, go back to the place where we were, the lodge we're staying, which is pretty close to the wedding venue. Um, then we get a phone call. Um, and the phone call is from some people who say, listen, are you so-and-so? And we say, yes, I am so-and-so. Uh, then they say, listen, hold on the phone. You need to listen to somebody. And they give the phone to someone else. And the other person who has the phone says, listen, we have, um, we've captured your brother. Um, and we want a certain amount of money. We want 8,000 rand now. Um, if you don't give that 8,000 rand, we're going to do some damage to him. And while this person is speaking, I can hear my brother screaming and, and wailing. Uh, they are beating him up. Um, and so immediately the mind changes. Um, this whole drama goes on for the next 18 hours. Um, it ends up with us going to the police station. We get to the police station. Um, there's people who are supposed to help us out, but the entire police station is engulfed in a race war. The white cops are insulting the black cops, and the black cops are saying, you guys are being racist. This is a police station in Hanidu. And nothing much is going on there until they eventually call one of the top ladies. She comes over and she says, listen, I really want to help you guys. Gives us a long story. Um, Griselda tries to call an uncle of hers, and who's, a, who's an investigative police officer. And then he gives us advice. We get hold of some guy. The guy comes through and he says, listen, guys, um, as a cop, I'm not supposed to tell you this. But if you want to see your brother alive again, just pay the money. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but just, you know, just, just do it. Um, and while we're at the police station, these guys are not calling me because I'm the contact. And what you see in the movies was very real force. Um, where I'm talking to them and I'm trying to calm them down. I've seen a couple of hostage movies where, you know, you try and calm down the person just so that they're not. I was trying to do that, trying to give them nice platitudes and tell them that they're great people and that sort of thing. Um, meanwhile, trying to buy time so we could speak. But once we got to the police station, I had to ignore them. And then once we left the police station, 
Um, when I started talking to them, they were like, listen, we don't want to talk to you anymore. So what they typically do is they'd beat him up, make him scream, and then say, you want the money, then cut the phone. So you can't really get, you can't really get to talk to them. Um, so eventually I then said, okay, cool, let's raise the money. You raise the money. Um, then the next morning I said to them, listen, I didn't sleep that night. Um, I want to... I want to pay you guys. And I said, listen, go to a shop right. When you go to shop right, there's like a, 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 an e-money system. You'll get there, um, send the money to this very phone number. So they give us a phone number. We try and track that phone number. It's a cell C phone number. It can't be tracked even by the cops and that sort of thing, so we're told. Um, we get to the place with the parents. We drive there. We get there. I want to send the money to the number. And then shop right tells us, no, listen, you need to have an ID. Um, and we're foreigners. So um, I then call the guys and say, guys, we don't have an ID. And the guy's like, listen, you're trying to buy time. Um, we're going to kill him. I'm like, no, but just hold on. Um, so we eventually, then they say, listen, um, are there security guards by the complex? And I'm like, yeah, there's a couple of security guards around here. Then they say, okay, listen, go and talk to one of them, ask if they have an ID, give them 100 rand, use their ID to get the whole system, then you can send the money to us. I'm like, okay, great. So we go over to the security guard and I'm like, hey, listen, um, I need some help. And the security guard say, listen, we don't have IDs, my brother. Um, wait for our bus, our bus is supposed to arrive. And so I get all of these guys, I'm like, guys, we don't have an ID. And the guy's like, listen, you're trying to buy time. We're not really pleased with this. And they beat him up again. I can hear him screaming. They give him the phone and he's literally pleading. There's nothing that breaks your heart as listening to your own brother saying, listen, man, I don't know how I got myself into this but these guys are really going to do damage to me. I'm really hurt as I'm speaking to you now. Can you do something to help? Because you just try and keep a steady mind just so that you stay focused in all of this. Um, that night we go to bed. Um, a Facebook message is sent through that says, I'm at such a place. None of us saw it. We kind of ignored it. The next morning, Griselda lets me know, like, listen, I got a message. It looks like my brother got hold Touch, got, 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 got hold of us through Facebook. Uh, now I'm not sure whether is it, is it him or is it some ploy or whatever else is going on. I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, but then we end up deciding, okay, listen, this is what we're going to do. Let's go to another place and let's see if we can pay this money. While we're there on our way going to the place to pay the money, another message comes in again from Facebook and it, it looks like it's him communicating with us. So I decide, okay, fine, we're going to turn from here and go straight to this place where he's saying he's at. We look at the watch, it is 30 minutes. These guys call again and say, listen, you need to send the money in 20 minutes. So we get into the phone and I continuously try and negotiate them down EDC. I try and buy a bit more time and tell them, listen, guys, I've got a couple of problems EDC. Meanwhile, we're dashing off to this place, driving breakneck speed. We eventually get there um, and we look around. We're not sure whether we'll find this guy with them or find my brother or these guys, whatever it is. So when we were growing up, we used to watch the A-Team. Anyone remember the A-Team? B.A. Barakas EDC. Uh, and there's, there's a refrain. Duh, 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 duh. You remember that? Okay. So we used to whistle that, like. So we used to do that when we were kids. Like if we couldn't get hold of each other, then the whole crowd would do that. So I get there. We're now in our thirties, and I see him sitting right over there, but I can't tell who's because there's lots of people. I don't know who's who. So I do exactly that. I walk up to an elevator at an vantage position, and then I go. <laughs> Immediately he turns, and he starts looking around like, okay, where is he, where is he, where is he, where is he? And I keep playing it just slowly, and of course, I'm avoiding trying to raise my hand, but every part of me wants to do it. Uh, then he eventually turns and sees where I am. When he sees where I am, I'm like, then I start turning and I start walking. So does my father. And we just start walking and walking very fast. Um, we can't even turn around and look back who we are. Until we walk, until we're out of the mall, then he eventually follows, and then when I look, I see him alone, and there's nobody else, and we're like, Phew, okay, great. Um, we get to the car, we brought both uh, my mom and my sister-in-law, because we knew this was going to be very emotional for him, so he needed womanly, he needed, you know, a, a mother to be able to hold him. So when we get there, my mom hugs him, and it's just tears all over, ETC. Uh, we focus, the wedding is the next day. Um, say, okay, guys, let's get into the car, and let's go back so we can prepare, and that sort of thing. We're supposed to be doing certain things, and things went down. So we get into the car, and we start driving off. While we're driving off, Griselda calls me and she says, honey, I don't want you to panic, but we have a problem. Um, one of the girls jumped into the pool and it looks like she's drowned. Um, I'm like, okay, um, what's her condition? And she says, listen, uh, we've called the medics, the medics have come, they're working on her, it looks like she's okay, but we don't know how well she is. I'm like, okay, now we're driving back, and I'm looking at the time. We've got about 20 minutes. We need to get to this place. The mother is in the back. I brought her along to comfort my brother. But now we have a second problem. And so I said to them, listen, guys, we're driving. We're going off, but we've got another problem, and I just want us to pray. Can we pray while we're driving? So we pray while we're driving, and I say to my aunt, auntie, please have a strong heart. And she's like, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm saying, like, honey, 
Hunty, listen to me, have a strong heart. So we keep driving. Then we get another phone call. And they're like, no, the medics want to know if you guys have medical aid or not because they're from the UK. Uh, and this time I couldn't help it. Then she says, what is wrong? By now her voice is shaking. So what's wrong? And I eventually give the phone to her. She hears what's going on. We need to stop the car. She runs into traffic. She's just totally hysterical. Uh, we stop the car. We eventually get her. My mom then needs to comfort her, and it's another crying session. Then we eventually get to the place. When we get there, the medics have taken her off to the hospital. We follow down to the hospital, and we wait there for about three hours. No one's saying anything of what's really going on because there's a threat of secondary drowning. Uh, that evening, the parents eventually make it late, and we all just collapse, and uh, the next day was the wedding. In that moment, when all of this stuff was going on, as a family, we had to have a meeting and get together and say, are we still going to go ahead with this wedding or not? Because as we, as, as we spoke at that point, we hadn't yet gotten a hold of our brother. So were we going to hold a wedding knowing very well that one of us could be dead? The wedding meant a lot to us, but our brother's life meant a lot to us. What were we going to do? At that point, that scripture came to mind. And David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I remember, sorry, getting a bit emotional. I remember standing up and saying, I've seen other people say this kind of prayers and they kind of sound crazy, but I'm going to do it today. And I stood up and I said, Satan, you're not going to get hold of my marriage. I'm going to get married to the love of my life and you're going to do nothing to stop that. As far as I'm concerned, wherever Tintin is, that's what we call him, he's going to be safe and he'll be found. You are not getting in the way. I'm not allowing you to. And I started walking around the entire place, pacing and speaking loudly and loudly. No one said anything to me. When I came out, when we got into the meeting, we said we're going ahead with the wedding. The devil will not stop this thing. It's still going to go ahead. A couple of hours later, that's when we got the call that um, he was at the uh, place, and that's when we got to go and we got to pick him up. Some of you people may have gone through some of this stuff. Some of you are yet to go through it. I'm really sorry for taking your time. But you're going to go through something like this if you aren't already going through it. And at that very important point where it matters all the more what you're thinking, God needs you to think positive. God needs you to take hold of his promises and claim that I did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. May the Lord bless the reading of his word.